I'd, obviously, no need to be alarmed. That was not a real shock. We were just enacting an old, very famous experiment that you may have heard about. It is May 1962. Done by this guy. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. That's Stanley Subject Milgram talking about the experiment in a film. In case you've never heard of this, you probably have, but in case you haven't, Here's what he did. He recruited a bunch of subjects. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50. It's normal, everyday dudes. The subjects range in occupation from corporation presidents to good humor men and plumbers. And he ran them through something like what you and I just did. He would have each subject sit down at a table. I have a seat right here. In front of this really impressive looking machine. This machine. It had lots of switches on it. Uh, generates electric shocks. When you press one of the switches all the way down, the learner gets a shock. And in the other room, there was a guy who he called the learner, who was supposed to have memorized some words. And every time that guy got a word wrong, wrong, like you just did, yep. which happened constantly, the, answer is neck. the volunteer was instructed to shock that guy with higher and higher voltage. Now, the volunteer couldn't see the guy he was shocking, but he could definitely hear him. Milgram staged the whole thing like it was some experiment about memory and punishment, but of course it wasn't about that. Continue, please. It was about how far would these people go? How many times would they shock that sad sap in the next room just because they were being told to? Let me out of here. Let me out the guy here. yelling, of course, was an actor and the shocks weren't real, but the questions in the air at the time were very real. Prosecution, the Attorney General. This was a moment when human cruelty was on trial. Quite literally. When I stand before you, judges of Israel, in this court, to accuse Adolf Eichmann, I do not stand alone. So Stanley Milgram actually begins these experiments the same year that Adolf Eichmann goes on trial for Nazi war crimes. That's radio producer Ben Walker. He'll be our guide for this segment. And in the trial, when the prosecutors essentially ask him how you came to commit genocide, he would say over and over again, It was not my personal affair. I was just following orders. I had to do what I was ordered. And it's this defense. This is basically what Stanley Milgram set out to test in a lab at Yale University with a bunch of regular Americans. Like, is that something that's universal yeah. or just an Eichmann thing? Yeah. He figured maybe 1% of these men would keep flicking the switches up to the highest voltage, but that's not what he found. 65% Continue, please. were willing to shock their fellow citizens over and over again, even past when they were screaming in pain. Something's happened to that man in there. Even when they stopped screaming? Yeah, when they were maybe dead. You better check in on him, sir. He won't answer me or nothing. Please uh, continue. Go on, please. They continued shocking their corpses. His experiment remains one of the most famous experiments of the 20th century. In 1962, Stanley Milgram shocked the world with his study on obedience. It is still trotted out to explain everything from hazing to war crimes. What is there in human nature? To gang behavior. That allows an individual to act inhumanely. Genocide. Harshly, severely. It's like a downloadable from the internet instant defense for doing wrong. But... If you look at Milgram's work closely... Yeah, 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 yeah. Like this guy did. Alex Haslam, professor of psychology at the University of Exeter. Then a different picture will emerge. Really, that story has been told a million and one times for the last 50 years. We've just got to get, got to get over here. Now, what you need to understand about Alex Haslam is that he hates it when interviewers only want to talk about the baseline study. The one that everybody knows, the so-called baseline. The 65% one. The one we just talked about. Yeah. So there's more? There's more to it? Yeah. Because actually, he studied between 20 and 40 different variants of this same paradigm. Stanley Milgram took electric shocks very seriously. He did this experiment a bunch of times and in, in a bunch of different ways. He had all sorts of different things. He, he would change where the shocker and the shock he sat. He had women participants. He had an experimenter who wasn't a scientist but was a member of the general public. And every scenario produced a different result. Really? Yep. 
let me i mean i'm just uh, i've got in front of me i've just got the uh, the data from the milgram study let me just get that out i mean so again I think the baseline study is the one where 65 percent of the volunteers go all the way highest dose of electricity xxx but in experiment number three if they put the shocky in the same room with the shocker, so the shocker could actually see the person that he's shocking. Uh, obedience drops to about 40%. In an experiment number four, when the teacher has to hold the learner's hand down on a plate in order for him to feel the shocks, it drops to about 30%. Wow. Experiment 14. If the experimenter is not a scientist, but is an ordinary man not wearing a white coat, obedience drops to 20%. Oh. Really? Well, how low can we go? Okay. Here's another one. This variant... Experiment 17. There's you and there's two other participants. Both actors. If those two participants refuse to go on. Like saying, like, I don't want to kill a guy. Only 10% under those circumstances go on. And then the final one. Experiment 15. Of course, normally you just have one experimenter who's giving you these instructions. But if you put two experimenters in the room and. They start disagreeing with each other. And this, this one, you get 0% going all the zero. way. Zero. Zero in that condition. You said zero. None like go right a- to the absolute end. No, no, zero. Not one person. No one. No. Not a soul. Exactly zero percent. Well, all right. I'm starting to feel a little bit better about my fellow man. One second. Hey, 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 hey. Shh. <laughs> okay. Where is he? I'm, I'm in a closet. You're in a closet? Because <laughs> this room is echoey, and, you know, there's nothing like a closet full of clothes to, like, help balance that out. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> all right, so keep going. So you see, it's just in that one experiment that 65% of people are willing to go all the way. Yeah. But in all of these other scenarios, they don't. And even when they do say yes, even when they go along with the experiment, as you can see in the film, Woman. they struggle. Continue using the last switch on the board, please. I'm not getting no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. They have debates with themselves. Don't you think you should look in on them, please? Debates with the experimenter. Not once we've started the experiment. But what if something's happened to a man had an attack or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, uh, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we might. But he might be dead in there. What's interesting is that how all of these struggles, all of them, play out the same way. It's the experimenter prodding the shockers along. You're going to keep giving them, what, 450 volts every shot now? That's correct. For me, it's all about the prods. This is what totally pulled me into this story. The prods. Stanley Milgram had four scripted prods that he wrote out for his experimenters. For when the subjects didn't want to continue? Yep. The first one was, please go on. Continue, please. And if they didn't go on, if they resisted, the experimenter would break out prod number two. The experiment requires that you continue. Well, the experiment requires that you continue. Well, I mean, I know it does, sir, but I mean, (laughs) he's up to 195 volts. And if they still were resisting or struggling, they'd get prod number three. It's absolutely essential that you continue. It's absolutely it's essential. essential that you continue. It's a little bit more direct. It's a bit stronger, but it's not an order. Not quite. But the fourth prod... Really, the, 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 critical, the, the critical fourth prod is an absolute order. The fourth prod is... You have no other choice, teacher. You have no other choice, teacher. You must continue. That is definitely an order. Exactly. But every time the experimenter pulled out the fourth prod... And this was confirmed when the experiment was redone in 2006. Total disobedience. Total Total disobedience. Any time the experimenter said, you must continue, the shocker would say, hell no, I don't. You had no other choice, teacher. Mm, I have a choice. I'm not going to go ahead with it. Well, we'll have to discontinue the experiment then. I'm sorry. Here's another one. We had no other choice. You must yes, go on. Yes, I have a choice. That is, if you don't continue, uh, we're going to have to discontinue the uh, experiment. We'll have to. He says cut it out. After all, he knows what he can stand. That's my opinion. That's where I'm going to stand on it. Wow, so the subjects seem willing to shock another human being, but as soon as you say it's an order... They don't do it. Huh. Now that's important, it's very important, because if you ask university undergraduates what does the Milgram study show, they will invariably say something like, they show that people obey orders. Okay. Well actually the one thing that the study really doesn't show is that people obey orders. And it's a pretty big thing to miss, it's a pretty f- big thing to miss, <laughs> isn't it, really? So wait, if it doesn't show that people are just obeying orders... 
Yeah. Then what does it show? Okay, I think it looks it's like this. All right, let's go on to our instructions. We will begin with this test. The participants are there in the, in the study. Each pair of words in They've got a, a very plausible, very credible, high-status scientist in a high-status scientific institution Yale. who is going to do this powerful piece of science. Direct your voice toward that microphone. As the room's so they sit down in the chair thinking, wow, this is really important. I'm about to help this quest for knowledge. I really want to do a good job. Now, as we sort of know in life, lots of things that we do, if they're worthwhile doing, are not always easy. And you find yourself in a situation where you've got to do something that's hard. Like shocking an innocent stranger over and over. But if you think that's the right thing, if you think that science is worth pursuing, you say, OK, I'll go along with this. So you're saying they were shocking these people because they thought it was worthwhile? Look, the participants, you know, they're not, it's not, it's not just blind obedience. So, oh, you tell me, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. Answer, please. They're engaged with the task. They're trying to be good participants. Are you all right? They're trying to do the right thing. They're not doing something because they have to. They're doing it because they think they ought to. And that's all the difference in the world. 120 volts. Suddenly I'm thinking this is actually a darker interpretation it's than the original. absolutely darker. Because they are doing it. No question about it. They have the agency. Yep. And they think it's right. Although clearly on some level they know it isn't. There's a sort of chilling comparison, which is a speech that Himmler gave to the SS, some SS leaders, when they were about to commit a range of atrocities. And he said, look, this is what you're going to do is, of course you don't want to do this. Of course nobody wants to be killing other people. And we realise this is hard work. But what you're doing is for the good of Germany. And this is necessary in order to advance our noble cause. Wow. So then, hey, wait! I'm almost done, guys. Give me two more minutes. Two more minutes. <laughs> so, in the Milgram case, uh huh. Well, if the idea is that people will do bad if they think it's good, like it's a good noble cause. Well, what's the noble cause in this case? Science. Science. You can see this in the surveys that the men filled out after the experiments were over. This was exactly what was on my mind. If the experiment, if the experiment had to be successful, it had to be carried on. The questionnaires they filled out are part of the Milgram archive at Yale. Willing to help in a worthwhile experiment. And it's kind of surprising. A lot of them are really positive, even though they've just been told that they were duped. Research in any field is a must, particularly in this day and age. Do you think that more studies of this sort should be carried out? Definitely yes. We, as, as onlookers to the study, we have this kind of godlike uh, sort of vision of like, well, of course what they're doing is wrong. But if it looked at from another perspective, there is a sense in which you could celebrate what they're doing. You're, I mean, I'm not suggesting one should, but I'm just saying there is a sense in which these people are prepared to do something that's very painful to them and to someone else because they want to promote science. Well, you know, you can see that's a good thing. I mean, you know, what I'm giving... God, because it's like we started with this experiment that we all see as evidence of human's latent capacity for evil. Yeah. And you tell us, actually, no, under some circumstances, we don't do the bad thing we're told to do because, here's another flip, we don't have to be told. In fact, we hate being told, but we will do it on our own if we think it's good. Yeah. Now you're saying, actually, that you could read that, that very dark fact, as being actually evidence of something quite... Yeah. Quite noble. Well, if you dressed it up and if you just had some minor variance to the paradigm, you could presumably make you know make this out. These are these are people who are incredibly noble. They are. I mean, it's the fact, of course, that they're administering pain to a stranger. That's what's horrifying about it. But imagine they were administering pain to themselves. Imagine they really were had to administer shocks themselves or something. But if they were prepared to do that, when well, I suspect a lot of them would, um, then we'd say these are people who really believe in science. And isn't this a good thing that we have people in our society who are willing to make sacrifices wow. for a great the greater good hmm. so in the end where do you come down do you leave this experiment in a light mood or in a dark mood uh i th I, I, I overall I, I would say in a powerful mood we're close to some really fundamental truths about human nature and you know my views about human nature are that it affords infinite potentials for lightness and dark there's lots and lots of lessons here but one is i think you know when you're enjoined to do something for the greater good maybe ask yourself the question what is greater and what is good Oh, well, that right there. I've slapped some quotations around that. <laughs> yeah.
Our thanks to Ben Walker, whose podcast, he has a podcast and it's a good one. It's called Too Much Information. Yes, it's awesome. Thank you, Ben. And also thank you to Alex Haslam, professor of psychology at the University of Exeter. We'll be right back. Start of message.